I truly hope that you long for the king to be on his throne, present in the future, as well as in not, nah, right? There's a, there's a, oh, thank you. All right, yeah, I, would, I know I forget something. There we go. How about that? Is that better? All right, thanks. The wonders of our God and the kingdom of God is just something that is amazing to think and to consider. And so as we come to this Easter season, this morning we're going to be looking at a post-resurrection message. What do we do because Jesus died and was raised? I mean, Easter is all about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But then he calls us to do something with it. And so last week we talked about the idea of the message being to repent and to follow. And so we're going to continue that thought uh, this week as we think about discipleship, understanding the kingdom. I just want to give you a little bit of insight, um, just a little update on the process. I finished my eighth class. So we're two years through this three-year process. And so um, I thank you for the opportunity to take time to dig into scriptures, to um, start to piece some of these things together. And so the work from last week, the work of today, are things that didn't just happen during this past week, but have ha happened over the past months as I continue to uh, study God's word. And so I just want to continue to encourage each of you I don't know if there's ever a time that I've walked away from studying God's word where I have not been blessed. And so I want to encourage each of you in your daily reading of God's word to dig in, to chew, to ask questions, to understand, and to be blessed by God because you then know him in a more intimate way through his spirit and through his word. And so I, I pray that for you. I'm thankful for myself. We have these opportunities uh, to bring God's word before you. I, I do not take it lightly. I know Pastor Andy does not take it lightly. And so um, thank you for allowing me to be your pastor and being able to do these things. Um, let me pray. Father, I'm just overwhelmed with your goodness uh, to me, to this church body, to my family, to my friends. You, you certainly are gracious and compassionate. You're long-suffering. You're, you're slow to anger. You're faithful. You have a loyal love. And so all these things, as I just come here uh, to be your uh, messenger this morning, just humbles me to think about your great love for me and for your people and how you reign over us. And so I, I pray, Lord, that as we dig into your text today, that, that we will truly worship you, that you are seated on the throne, you are ruler over everything, and that we would submit to you and your holy ways, that we wouldn't reject you, but that we would bow down and worship you. And so, Lord continue to direct uh, this corporate worship service so that we might worship you in spirit and in truth. Thank you for your word. May you sanctify us in your truth this morning. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I alluded to, we're going to continue our study on discipleship. And as we learned last week about discipleship, it's not just about the mind. It's not just about the brain. It's not just to fill my brain with Bible information, but it's to change the course of my life. Oh, there it goes, yep. Repentance, we learned about repentance and how it requires, um, what is required of it in our lives. On our own, we'll become lost hikers in this world, right? We'll, we'll be wandering around the woods, going around in circles, but with God, His Word, and His Spirit, we can stay walking in that right direction towards Him. When Jesus calls us to follow, it's about our whole being. It's about our beliefs, our desires, our actions, and that all of those might be imitating Jesus. Jesus calls his disciples to repent and follow. And understanding this call is not difficult in theory. But practice, well, that's another thing, isn't it? 
It's much more difficult to repent and to follow and to stay on course because we get distracted. We lose focus in life. And I believe one of the reasons for this is, is purpose. Without keeping a strong purpose in life, people will stop working and heading in the direction in which God has called them. Dave Ramsey talks about purpose in his financial peace seminar regarding an experiment done at a local college. They were digging ditches. Researchers put up flyers around campus and they said, come work for us. We will pay you $7 an hour. And you're like, what? $7 an hour. Well, this is from 25 years ago. So $7 an hour was pretty good for an unskilled laborer to come and, and do some work. And think about this as being starving college kids. I mean, I know they give blood and plasma and do all kinds of things as far as trying to make money. And so 7 bucks an hour to, to do some work, pretty good idea. And so they, were, they came, they arrived uh, at the location that they were told, and... The, uh, the researchers or their bosses said, dig this ditch. And they worked at it all day. They worked hard at it. And at noon, they had their lunchtime break. And the, the bosses or the researchers came to them. And they said, now, fill this ditch back in. And they're like, well, well, why? Why would we fill the ditch back in that we just dug? He says, I'm paying you seven bucks an hour. Do you really care? And they're like, no, we don't care. We'll fill the ditch back in. And so they did. They filled the ditch back in. It took up the rest of the afternoon. When the work was completed, their bosses came to them and told them, come back tomorrow and I'll pay you $14 an hour. Well, as you can imagine, only 40% of the workers showed up the next day. Even though they were going to be making $14 an hour, only 40% returned. And when they arrived there, they said, okay, what's the work to do? And he's like, dig a ditch. And so they spent the whole morning digging a ditch, only for the bosses to come back at noon and tell them, fill it back in. And so they did. I said, you know what? Come back tomorrow, and I'll give you another $7. I will increase your pay to $21 an hour. Again, 25 years ago, pretty good pay. Well, as you can guess, on that third day, only another 40% of them showed up. So if you think, if you add, do the math of the, the percentages and the people that were there, that's only 15% of the original workers who came back to dig this ditch. Now from time to time, I'm sure we've all worked a, a J-O-B. At least back in my day, that's what we called jobs. If there was something without purpose. You know, the only purpose was that I needed money so I could go buy pizza. Or I needed money so I could go to the movies, or whatever it may be. But I worked a J-O-B, and I had no other purpose than just, I wanted money. I wanted to fulfill some desire that I have to keep going. But here, only 15% of the college students thought that money was enough incentive to keep them doing the work. I want to submit to you that people need a purpose in life. If I'm digging a ditch, at least let me put a cable line or electrical line in it. Maybe it's for irrigation to move water from one place to the other, but it has to have some value or some purpose for digging the ditch. I can't just do the work and then fill the work in and undo the work that I've just done. I need more than that. I'm afraid to say... But I think many Christians have the same mentality when it comes to Jesus' call to be his disciple in their lives. They don't understand the purpose. They think of it as coming and digging a ditch and then at noon filling it back in. They don't understand the whole plan of God in their life. Sure, there's going to be benefit one day. I'm going to heaven, right? So that sounds good. It's better than the alternative, but I really don't understand what that other value is. Because if I'm honest with you, my thoughts of heaven are minimal. Add that to our culture, and what do they think? We'll be up in the clouds, stringing the, the harp, right? Isn't that what heaven's going to be? Or if we're a little bit more spiritual, we say, well, we're going to be around the throne of God, worshiping all day, every day, for eternity. And they go... That could be good for a little while, but I mean, I like concerts and all, but like, 
around the throne forever? And that's, what we're, that's really what my purpose is going to be for eternity? And I'm being a little facetious here. But I, if I'm honest, I think my life here on earth is going to be better than whatever my mind thinks that that future life may be. Michael Vlock's summary of the problem is this. Many Christians live without understanding God's kingdom purposes. They know that they're saved and headed for a better place someday, but their understanding of the kingdom is foggy and often clouded with unbiblical conceptions. The kingdom has been over-spiritualized for so long and made so abstract that many Christians why or wonder why they don't long for it. Do you long for the kingdom of God? Not just ruling in your life right now in this presence, in this present situation, this present context, but forever in understanding his plan. Now, I know what I told you last week. I said, we're not going down that road of defining the kingdom of heaven. Remember I said last week, the message was repent. The kingdom of heaven is near. And I said, man, there's lots to think about when we talk about the kingdom of heaven. Well, I took some of my own advice. I repented. I said last week that we're not going down that road, but this week, we're going down that road. We're going to talk about the kingdom of heaven. Because I agree with Michael Vlach that I think we're confused about what the future looks like, and therefore, because we don't understand our purpose in the now, which leads to the future, that we are digging ditches and filling them back in our lives if we're doing the work of the ministry that God's called us to at all. We need to repent. We need to follow and imitate Jesus. But yet many of us kind of do this half-heartedly or casually. Instead of saying, behold, our king seated on the throne. What we just sang. Do you really mean that? Or is that just kind of like emotionalism that was rearing up in you? Because of a song? Or do you really believe that and long that and desire for that in your heart? And so I've repented. It's important for a disciple of Jesus to understand God's kingdom. It's a mistake for me not to give you a road map. But just knowing and giving you a road map today, I liken it to programming a GPS. I've plugged in certain criteria that's going to affect the path that we take. Just like with a GPS, you can say highway, back roads, you can say least miles traveled or fastest route. This morning, I have plugged in a grammatical, historical, literary approach. Yeah, I know. What? <laughs> what is he talking about? When studying the Bible, there are two or three main approaches. Think of it this way. When a person reads their Bible through rose-colored glasses, I'm not talking about your glasses, Rose, but I'm just talking about rose-colored glasses, it affects everything that they see. And likewise, if a person reads the Bible with blue-colored glasses, it affects everything that they read. The same is true for one's approach in setting the GPS for the highway roads or fastest route. Again, let me return to Michael Vlock regarding the kingdom of God and this approach. This approach seeks to understand what a Bible author meant by what he wrote, knowing that under inspiration his intent is God's intent. This is sought through an understanding the vocabulary, the grammar, the historical background, the genre of the books of the Bible. Thus we search for a passage meaning by examining the passage itself, seeking the author's intention in his written text. I'm taking that same approach to scriptures this week, as Pastor Nania and I do every week. This is the same approach. But I just want you to know, it's, more, it's magnified when it comes to the kingdom of God. There's nothing new that I'm doing here, but I just want to be clear at the beginning, because when you're set on this type of approach, the path is set before you. Of reading the other folks who think of the kingdom being in another way, they comment and they summarize this very same thing. They say, if you use a literal, historical, grammatical approach, you will end up on this path. And so that's all I'm telling you here at the beginning. 
so that you know how we're arriving, because it's important as far as when we're thinking about how to operate our lives. So let me just give you one example. Some Bible interpreters believe, regarding the kingdom of God, that there's no physical 1,000-year kingdom on earth ruled by Christ. They think the kingdom is present in our hearts. They're called amillennialists. Millennial meaning 1,000, and the A before it negating it. Okay? So they're called amillennialists. There's another camp where they believe that there is a physical 1,000-year kingdom on earth ruled by Christ. And they're called premillennialists. Millennial again meaning 1,000, but pre referring to Christ. That is, the second coming of Christ is prior to this 1,000-year kingdom reign. Now there's more. And it gets even deeper. But that's all we need to look at for now. Just realize that our approach affects our understanding. It's important to understand God's kingdom program because it gives his disciples purpose regarding their calling. See, too many of us just look at our calling as individually. We don't think about the greater kingdom of God. But let me just tell you, the kingdom of God is not about you. We're so self-centered in our ways, aren't we? Everything's about me and myself and how everything else is going to affect me. We live in a me-centered world instead of a Christ-centered world. It's his kingdom, his nation. We're under his rule. We're thankful to be even a part of it. Shouldn't we be having that attitude? Amen. Yes, the calling is individual, but the individual calling is a part of something much larger. You're not just digging ditches without a purpose. But understanding God's purpose for his disciples is crucial for faithfulness during this present age. So please open your Bibles to Matthew 28, verse 18. That's what we're looking at this morning. Matthew 28, verse 18, as we continue to examine the Great Commission. Now this message is going to be different from our normal verse by verse. Because the kingdom of God is not given in a verse by verse passage. You're going to see it. Well, I told you last week, there's 30 references in the book of Matthew alone to the kingdom of heaven. And then if you just take out that phrase and just talk about the kingdom, there's 26 more in Matthew. So there's 56 references in Matthew alone. Remember, the doctoral work I'm doing is all in this Matthew 28 passage. And so really it's doctoral work that's on the whole book of Matthew. <laughs> and so I'm going to give you a glimpse of that this morning. I cannot do it all in this one setting. And so this will be part one. Part two will not be next week. Part two will be in about a month from now. But I just want you to understand that we need to be thinking about the kingdom of God. And I wish that there was really just one portion of scripture where we could just hunker down. But we're going to need to be able to hit several passages this morning. So as you are hearing this message this morning, my advice to you is, I'm going to put all the scriptures on the screen. Don't try to like go back and forth in the scriptures. If you can, that's great. I'm not saying don't read your Bibles that way. But I'm just saying I'm going to give you a zoomed out argument. And so instead of trying to get all the details down of everything, listen to it from a zoomed out way. Believe me. Each of the passages that are put in front of you, I have spent time in context, in the front and on the back side of that. That's why I've told you, this sermon is about a month or two in the making. And so I hope you're ready to sit back for a month or two to hear. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I promised that I would hold back this week and I don't do better in timing. Um, that's what happens. I get all this stuff so pent up in me and then I just got to, you know, speak it and teach it. But... I pulled back on my purpose for this week and limited it. At first I was going to have three goals. Now we're just attacking one goal this morning. So just know that I love you, that I care for you, and I care for how long you can, can be seated there. But just know that I've done the work. And I'm not saying just trust me blindly, but we're recording this. And so hear the overarching argument this morning, and then come back and listen to it a second time. Or a third time and then dig into it as we continue to go down this road and understand the kingdom of God because it's a large topic very large topic so let me just define it really simply God's rule 
over his creation. The kingdom of God is God's rule over his creation. But as we get into this, we're going to see there's a lot more to it than that. And so we're going to need to expand the definition when we get to different passages. And so that's what we'll do. But Matthew 28, verses 18 and 20. Originally I had us working through 20. We're not going to be working through 20 this morning. We're just on Matthew 28, 18. Then Jesus came up and said to them, remember, this is post-resurrection, all authority, so you're like, how do we get kingdom out of this passage? All authority, okay, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now context, therefore go and make disciples. Remember, we're tying this into last week where I told you about repent. The kingdom of heaven is near, and there's a call for us to have this message going out to others. And so here we have it tied in, so this is how we're making the connection to last week. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. End of the age. What's the end of the age? Don't answer too quickly. <laughs> all right. Verse 18, Jesus' authority to rule. That's what we're looking at this morning. Jesus' authority to rule. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So just remember, Jesus has returned to the mountain in Galilee for his post-resurrection meeting. This is seen throughout the Gospels. He keeps on telling them that to go to the mountain it's in Matthew all over the place, but specifically, we see him talking about it in verse 16. And Matthew's talking to the 11 disciples. He's saying, go to the mountain. I, I think, I'm not dogmatic about this, but I think this is the same place where the Sermon on the Mount was given. I, I believe it to be true. But Matthew's saying, hey, disciples, go, and I will talk to you there. I will meet you there. Luke mentions women and other disciples. Remember when they went to the tomb and the women did? And then he said what? Go. And it was just go to Galilee. Go to the mountain. Paul writes about 500 believers gathering together for a meeting with Jesus in the post-resurrection time period. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 6. And so all I'm saying is, is that Jesus is holding a meeting because his disciples were confused about their purpose. He just died. And they're confused. They're thinking the kingdom's going to be ushered in. And they're like, he just died. What are we going to do now? And so they're working through this. Listen to Acts 1.3. After his suffering, right, Jesus, he presented himself alive with many convincing proofs. Remember Thomas? Touch me. Look at Look at Touch. Many convincing proofs. Proofs. He was seen by them over a 40-day period. So there's our time mark. We're talking about after the resurrection, before the ascension of Christ. And what did he speak about? About matters concerning the kingdom of God. Ah, there's our language. There's our words. Just a side note. Matthew uses kingdom of heaven. Mark uses kingdom of God. There's some work that needs to be done there in thinking about that. Are they the same? Are they different? I'll leave that as a teaser. But what a range of emotions that there must have been for the disciples. Uh, clearly, their definition of God's kingdom, when I'm talking about the disciples, was this. A political, earthly kingdom with Jesus the Messiah reigning. Read the Old Testament. And this makes sense over and over and over again. But then, Jesus dies. And so what are we going to do? Some of them said, I'm going fishing. Right? Some of the disciples, we heard about them last week, they said, I'm going back to fishing because I'm confused about our purpose. Jesus was alive, we're walking with him, now he's dead. What am I going to do? What are we supposed to do? And so there's a range of emotions that are, that are going on here. But all of a sudden, the resurrected Jesus is standing before them. And what do you think the disciples thought? Bam, baby, we're back on. We got this. The kingdom's coming, we're going to celebrate, we're going to march in. And so when they ask him, Acts 1, 6, 
Lord, is this the time when you're restoring the kingdom? It's very important here. To Israel? That's the question. That's the question they ask. And Jesus' answer is, no. It's not time for you to know when that will happen. But for now, but for this moment, this age, you will receive the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Jesus reiterates the call to make disciples of all nations. Right? We saw in Matthew 28, 18, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And, and he starts working through uh, this calling in verse 19 of going to all the nations. But then we see it in Acts 6 as well. And, and he talks about this idea of, of Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then where? The uttermost parts of the earth. He's talking about a message to the Gentiles. But back to 2018, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And so when we're talking about defining the kingdom more specifically, it's important to understand our verse has two or three essential ingredients According to Alva J. McLean, here are those ingredients. As far as having a kingdom definition, Alva J. McLean, the greatness of the kingdom. One, a ruler with adequate authority and power. You can't be a king, you can't be a ruler unless you have the authority. I know lots of people who like to say that they're the boss, who try to boss me around, but if I'm in my right mind, I'm like, you're not the boss of me. Or have you ever heard someone say, you're not the boss of me? To, to be a ruler, to have a kingdom, you have to have an authority or a power. Two, a realm of subjects to be ruled. In this case, we're talking about a nation. Israel was, was welcoming that and rejecting that at various times during their, their, uh, their history. Think about the judges. Think about, you go back, they, they worshipped and they, did, and they did other things in their own eyes. I mean, there was all this movement going back and forth on whether they were going to sit under the God's authority or they were going to reject God's authority. But there has to be a realm of subjects to be ruled. There has to be a people. You can't just be the ruler and have no subjects underneath you. What authority is that? And then lastly, the actual exercise of the function of rulership or ruling. And so there's the actual function that's going on. The Bible speaks of the kingdom both generally and specifically. So we're, we're taking this definition, and we're now going to think how scriptures start to talk about this kind of definition. And when we do that, we're going to see the rule of God over his creation in, is general, and then it becomes more specific at times. And so it's important for us to distinguish between the two. Is he talking about a general principle of the kingdom, or is he specifically talking about something in particular? So let's start with the general, overarching. The terminology is universal or eternal kingdom. That, that God rules over his creation really fits this one nicely. Because he's just talking about it generally. Here's Psalm 145, 13. Your kingdom is what? An eternal kingdom. And your dominion endures, what? Through all generations. And so there's never been a time where God has not been in rule over his creation. First Chronicles 29.11. Let's add space and time. O oh Lord, you are great, mighty, majestic, magnificent, glorious, the sovereign over all the heavens and earth. You have dominion and exalt yourself as ruler of all. We're talking about the universal kingdom. It's not just spoken, though, of God generally. Because when you look at these two passages, we're saying, well, yeah, God, you know, generally, overall. But let's get specific. Paul does that in 1 Timothy, doesn't he? And his prayer, if you think about that in 1 Timothy, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 15. This saying is trustworthy and desires full acceptance, just to be clear. He's talking about Christ Jesus here. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them. 
But here is why I was treated with mercy, so that in me, as the worst, Christ Jesus could demonstrate his utmost patience as an example for those who are going to believe in him for eternal life. Now, to the eternal king, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory. What? Forever and ever. Amen. Paul certainly believed that Jesus is part of the universal kingdom. That he's ruled from the beginning and he'll rule forever. It didn't just start at his incarnation or it didn't start at other places, but from the very beginning that Jesus Christ is ruler over all. That's the first side in talking about the kingdom. Now let's do a second side that teaches about God's rule on the earth. We're talking about God's rule on the earth. This is theocratic. Theocratic means God's rule. It's, just, it's theocratic. So sometimes you see these terms, and you're like, man, these terms. But they're not that complicated when you just know where to look. Or the mediatorial kingdom, and that's a whole other subject that we won't go down this morning. But you can understand what mediatorial means. There's a, there's a, there's a, a mediator. It's God's sovereign rule on the earth throughout the various epochs of biblical history continuing or uh, coming to a consummation where it's going to come to an end. And the future eschatological kingdom. I know. Eschatological means last days. The kingdom promises are concentrated on a literal, earthly, political, ethnic kingdom on the earth centered around the nation Israel. And so that's why the disciples were like, man, we're back in business. Jesus is here. He's going to politically rule in this, this eschatological kingdom. And he's like, no, that's not happening now. And so that's what we're thinking about as we talk about this type of kingdom. Last week, I gave you a very brief like, uh, look at this when I went to the genealogy of Matthew. Right? It started with Abraham, and then went to David, then went to the deportation in Babylon, and finally Christ. And so there was different epochs, there was different timings of how this kingdom looked. We heard the message, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. I said, John the Baptist did this. In Matthew 3, 2, Jesus did this in Matthew 4, 17. But I didn't explore one other with you last week for the sake of time. It's Matthew 10, 5 through 7. Jesus sent out these 12 disciples. Remember, they were following him. They were following his teaching. And this is the message that he told them as they, the instructions that they were supposed to follow. Do not go to the Gentile regions and do not enter any Samaritan town. Go instead to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It's very specific. As you go, preach this message that kingdom of heaven is near. This is the three times he uses it in Matthew. He doesn't tell us that at the end, in the Great Commission. It's similar, but it's not the same. It's not the same. So again, he's not speaking of a universal eternal kingdom here either. Because he wouldn't be saying that, it's, that the kingdom of heaven is near or approaching. Because his eternal rule is forever and ever. So he's not talking about the eternal kingdom here, but the theocratic kingdom. That's what's drawing near. And the problem is that Matthew records in chapters 11 and 12 that Israel rejected Jesus as the Messiah and his rule over them. And they ultimately did that by crucifying him on a cross. And so here's this message. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is near. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is near. And they're hearing this message. They even told Jesus that he was filled with demons, right, at one time. That's how much they rejected this message of Jesus ruling over them. They didn't want any part of it. When I'm saying the they, obviously the religious leaders I'm referring to there. But if we continue on in Matthew, Matthew 13 contains a bunch of kingdom parables that introduce this new concept of the church age. We're going to get to that later. 
So just, I'm going to introduce this, but just understand, there's, there's going to be an interruption. Eight, uh, Israel as a nation, Old Testament coming through, offer of the kingdom, they reject it. There's a pause. There's an interruption. And that interruption will not be restored until the thousand year physical reign on earth. And so because you've rejected the message, because you've rejected the Messiah, he starts to introduce this concept of what life is going to look like. And so the rest of this gospel, the gospel of Matthew, identifies a shift in mission. Israel was the focus, but now the Gentiles are included in the mission or the call. Matthew 28, 19, again, right? Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. I've already said this to you. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Acts 1, 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and all the farthest parts of the earth. Both Matthew and Luke record parables teaching the disciples about the consequences of Israel rejecting the Messiah. Parable of the tenants. Matthew 21. He starts to say to them about an owner who went on a journey and then leased the vineyard out. And when the owner sends the, the servant to come get the profits, the tenant was beaten. The first tenant was beaten when he came to collect. They, they then killed the second tenant. And a, the third one they stoned to death. Finally, he sent his son. What's the text say they did to him? They killed him. Because now we'll be heirs. That's what they thought. So Matthew 21, 42 and 43. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is from the Lord, and it is a marvelous in our eyes. For this reason I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce fruit. People who repent. People who are following Jesus. That's not only Matthew. That's also Luke. His is this, um, let me just give you the summary in Luke 19 of the Ten Ninas parable. While the people were listening to these things, Jesus proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem. And because they thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear, appear immediately. Therefore he said to them, a nobleman went to a distant country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. That's what we're going to address here in the next moments. Believers must be careful in understanding what Jesus accomplished in the first coming and what he'll accomplish at the second coming. All of this, all of this is a backdrop to our post-resurrection statement made by Jesus. All authority, right? All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And you're like, I hear what you're saying, but how? Help me connect this. How does this verse help us to understand Jesus' authority? Well, the word for authority refers to the right to rule. It's the right to rule. Jesus' authority is linked with his resurrection and position at the right hand of the Father as predicted in Psalm 110. Here's the Lord's proclamation to my Lord. Sit down at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. Drop down to verse 4. The Lord makes this promise an oath and will not revoke it. You are eternal priest after the pattern of Melchizedek. Oh. We should be very familiar with this because of our study of Hebrews. It's not talking about Jesus' eternal rule here. But being the king over the Davidic kingdom, which is the same as the eschatological kingdom, the thousand year reign on earth by Christ. See, Matthew places Jesus' assumption of the Davidic throne on earth and still future. 
and still future. This is Matthew 19, verse 28. Jesus said to them, it's the 12 disciples, I tell you the truth, in the age when all these things are renewed, when the Son of Man, another one for Jesus, uh, and as far as him being exalted, sits on the glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on the 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. He's talking about the future. He's talking about the, the thousand year reign on earth. His authority to rule as Messiah is granted to him. See, the resurrection meant something. Because if he already had this authority, and I didn't show this to you in Matthew, it talks about Jesus and having authority in Matthew. But when it comes to the resurrection, something different happens. There's a, there's a, a, there's a change, there's a newness to it. And what we're seeing is, it was the nation of Israel, they rejected that, and then it turns to the Gentiles. It turns into nations for this period of time. Then it goes back to the restoration aspect. So his authority to rule as Messiah is granted to him, yet the authority to rule will culminate in a physical kingdom reign. This is called regal authority. This rule is regal authority. A ruler may withdraw from his realm and exercise of his ruling function may be interrupted temporarily. That's what we saw in those two parables. He said, I'm going to become, I'm going to receive my authority. He receives that authority in heaven. And then it says what? And then I will return. Well, what's that period of time in between? Well, that's the age that we see in Matthew 28, 20. You see, again, the resurrection is a turning point. Matthew 28, 18 is a quote of Daniel 7, 14 in the Septuagint. It's a direct quote. And so you're wondering, how did you get all this stuff? I'm going, just, I'm telling you right now. All this was backdrop just to get to this so we can see what's going on. Because Matthew is quoting Daniel. And so starting at verse 13, just so that we have some understanding of what's going on in this scene... Daniel, I was watching the night visions. And with the clouds of the sky, one like the Son of Man, and this is a terminology used for Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of Man was what? He was approaching. Think about the ascension, right? Jesus is going up to God. So, and with the clouds of the sky, like one like the Son of Man was approaching, and where did he go? He went up to the Ancient of Days, God the Father. He went up to the Ancient of Days. That's where he went to. And was escorted before him. Now listen. To him was given ruling authority, honor, and sovereignty. Now listen to this. All peoples. All peoples, nations, and language groups were serving him. Then it switches. It says his authority, he says, you know what? He's had authority from the beginning of the earth, but from the, or the beginning of time, forever and ever. He's the eternal king. All authority is eternal and will not pass away, but his kingdom will not be destroyed. Matthew is consistent. It's amazing how consistent he is in his timeline. Matthew 24, 30. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't put 14 up there for you. Matthew 24, 30. On Jesus' authority. Then, the sign of the Son of Man, here's our connection again back to Jesus, will appear in heaven, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man arriving. He's arriving on the clouds of heaven, and then what's this? With power and great glory. Matthew's quote of Daniel 7.14 is not casual, but purposeful regarding the specific kingdom rule. This will be the subject of the next time that we meet and I'm preaching. Is how does this kingdom rule play out? We've just seen the whole backdrop here of, of the timing but we must examine this 
if we're going to understand the authority that Jesus possesses. And not only what he, he possesses, but the implications that it has to this current age. Because we think people misunderstand the kingdom of God, and so they start talking about all these other things that it doesn't mean. A kingdom in my heart. There's no literal thousand-year kingdom. They start saying all these things when they're, they're not reading, they're not assigning the appropriate definition to the appropriate uh, place of kingdom in there. So I know. I was hoping to accomplish a lot more uh, this week. But there's really a lot to consider here. So I, I want to just pull this back in for our remaining time. But first, for those of you who need to finish the outline, that's really not that difficult, is it? Jesus' presence in ruling. No, it's not an A. I'm sorry. But Jesus' presence in ruling. What does it mean that he's with you until the end of the age. What presence does, does Jesus have in your life? The other thing is, well, when's this end of the age? Who's he making the promise to? Is the promise just to the disciples there? Because in Matthew, if you're reading, he's just talking about the 11 disciples. So is the promise just to them? Or is the promise to more? Is it the promise to be made to all those who make disciples? And so those are all good things for us to be thinking and reading and studying and working through. Because it has, a, it has a, a cause and an effect on our purpose as disciples today. Now, in leaving you hanging, I'm going to give you one New Testament passage that should help with you. So I, I'll put a, a crumb out there for you. This is Ephesians 1, verse 20. This power, notice the language, this power he exercised in Christ when, there's a time marker, he raised him from the dead, and what? And seated him, he's approaching, right? He seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above every rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And God put all things under Christ's feet and he gave them to the church as head over all things. There is a ruling that's going on right now for the church. Christ is the head. Yes, we need to be submitting to Christ, the head of the church. But Christ is not just the head of the church. He's also the head and ruler of other items and things. Let's leave it at that for now. But how are we to think about this? We can't just have some blind belief and thinking like, heaven's all about me. We can't have this blind belief that, well, we're just really going to go to heaven and just sing, and that's all there really is for us to do. Think about restoration. That's what the promise is for the future. Go back to the garden. What were they given? Dominion. What were they given? What were they supposed to rule over? The animals in a perfect atmosphere where God was walking in their midst, and so there was certainly a universal rule over there, but there was also a rule on earth, wasn't there? I really believe when we talk about the restoration, that's what we're talking about. That the God's rule over his creation, certainly forever and ever, but then there's also a rule here on earth. The physical presence of God with us. But that's all in the future. And he's going to restore this. But I want you to know that we're going to be working in the future. We're not going to be just playing harps. What we do now, Paul tells us in Corinthians, 
That it matters. Amen. That it matters. Help us, Lord. I believe our faithfulness now will directly relate to our positions in the future. And so that's something for us to, that's certainly something that gives us purpose. We're not digging ditches and filling it back in. Are we giving the message of the gospel to a dying and lost world? Are we being obedient? Are we being faithful? There's much more than just evangelism, but sanctification going on in our lives. Are we saying, change me? Are we repenting? Anytime that we offend a holy God, are we calling sin the same thing that God calls us sin and say, I repent of it and I'm going to direct myself through God's word and through the spirit working in my life to where I follow God in my life, where I can imitate him in my character, in my being, with all my soul, all my, or me, all my mind, all my soul, all my heart, all my soul, and all my strength. Or are we just a casual Christian just going, I'm going to heaven. Because it's great things to think about. So let's do that. Let's think about God's kingdom. What's our desires? Do you really long for the kingdom? Or are you like, man, I'm pretty happy with my life right now. I think life's better now than it will be in the future. Do you have kingdom focus? Do you have desires for him? Do you have, are you following the kingdom directives? And so because of God's word, my next steps, well, maybe it's increase in kingdom understanding. And I want you to know there's a difference between, because I know some people can get really caught up in like, oh, I'm going to study out the last things. Study what God has given you with regards to the kingdom and what we know now. We can't predict the future. It's, it's, it's very difficult. I know all these people who spend all this time studying eschatology, and, and they're, they're not following the commands that God has given to them as far as what they're supposed to be doing right now because they're so concerned about knowing what's going to happen in the future, trying to figure out what's going to happen in the future, that they're no earthly good right now. And so I'm saying, don't get all preoccupied with last time's eschatology study, but do be preoccupied with the kingdom of God and knowing what that means and understanding that. I hope you can understand the difference between those two. Last time's focus is on the future, which you cannot control, but... Kingdom study helps us with our present faithfulness. It gives us purpose. If you can't come away from this without understanding how to exalt Jesus as king, that's why I asked for behold our God before this message. I hope every day that you're exalting Jesus as king because he is. He sits at the right hand of the Father. And so I hope every single day you're thinking about, how can I exalt Jesus, the King? Lastly, faithfully live for God. It means something. It does. It really means something. What you do today means something. And so be purposeful in being a disciple of God. Every believer is going to stand before Jesus at the Bema seat for their actions. And so how will your works be judged by Jesus. I'm not talking about salvation. That's God's work. But sanctification, there's work that we are called to do. Obedience, faithfulness. How will your works be judged by Jesus? And so don't live without purpose, but understand God's purpose for you during this present age, knowing that he is with you.